morning. We are, I, I said a moment ago, I'm just, I'm excited. I'm excited, I'm on fire, and I'm just thrilled, just thrilled to see what the Lord is doing for, not just for us, but as, as Reverend Robert said, for communities, the communities that we touch, the communities that begin to start not only knowing, but acknowledging, acknowledging who our Father is and just humbly submitting to Him. So with that said, I'm going to, let's get into the Word today. Let's get into the message. The message is titled this morning because I know many have. I've been one. We said, I can't. I can't in a lowly place. I can't. How often have you been so down in your life that you just said, I can't anymore? I can't get up. There are some folks that say, I can't get out of bed. I can't even open the windows right now, just the, the, the drapes to see the sunshine. I can't. We hear that so often. And then so often most people say, well, I can't. It's not in my vocabulary. Well, why is that for those people and not for others? Well, let's take a look at why that may happen. It's not that it's not in the vocabulary, it's just sometimes we just need a little push to get us there. Sometimes we need, as I said, that breath, that breath to put us there. And I'm sorry, brother, there was someone at the window that looked like they wanted to come in. You can invite them in, invite them in. Um, but I can't, you see, that's, uh, and I'm sorry, when you know this church here, when the Spirit speaks and moves, we just move with the Spirit and allow Him to. Um, we let no one be left outside of the door Amen. when they want to hear the word. Um, I, I really, it's not, it would not be appropriate. But I can't in a lonely place. And so, in looking at I can't, let's look at Second Corinthians, verse twelve, or Second Corinthians twelve, verse eight through ten. Eight and ten. This is Paul speaking. Paul says concerning this thing. I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. He said to me, Grace, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities or my weaknesses. That power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 10 goes on to say, Therefore I take pleasure in, in weakness or infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, what was going on there is this was Paul pleading not once, not twice, but three times to our Father to just take, cast this burden that was on him, cast it off of him. And see, many have requested, but feel the affliction is just much too much. And they choose to stop pursuing their own relief. Understand, how often do we pray for someone else, but then we stop praying for our own relief? You know, we see so much, and I know, and I know that our hearts are so big that we want to reach out and touch everyone. I know most of the folks that I come in contact with, hearts are large, and they just want to reach out and touch anyone that they can, wrapping their arms around them, whatever it is they can, just to let them know that they are loved. But then there are times that we ourselves forget or fail to pray for our own selves, for what we need. And this is not unique to just anyone else and not myself. I remember some time ago, someone told me, asked me, I said, Pastor, do you pray for yourself? And I had to think for a moment. I said, well, yeah, occasionally I do. See, that's really getting real when you start to ask yourself questions and then you have to come back and say, occasionally, occasionally I do. See, I find myself praying for so many people that sometimes I get up and I'm going, okay, I'm done. And then I'm saying, wait a minute, I forgot to pray for my own self. I thank God that there's prayer warriors out there that pray for me as well, but I know that I need to do that for myself. You should know that you need to do that for yourself. See, what Paul was going through was he was being afflicted 
And if you go to the to the uh, verse be, uh, before that, if you go to verse 7, it says, Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the re revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Listen, this thorn, as he goes on to say, that was given to him, says a messenger of Satan buffeted me, lest I be exalted above measure. See, Satan was involved right there. Many times he gets involved in our lives. Now, I'm not saying that this is all the time. Sometimes we give too much credit to Satan, thinking, oh, Satan did this. But it's not necessarily Satan has done that. Sometimes it's our own selves that do these things to yeah. ourselves. See, God works with that. God will work with that and shape you and mold you into something new, something different. See, oftentimes we're, we're, we, we, we pray for uh, others and we're, we're, we really need to be praying for ourselves. But then how much trust do you have in the Lord to continue praying? And hear me now. You continue praying for the manifestation that's already happened. What do I mean by that? See, when we go to the Lord in prayer, we already know, or at least we should know, that the Lord already knows our needs, our wants, our desires. He knows this already. So if we are praying for that, we're not petitioning for him to answer that. The Lord's already answered that, but what we are asking for is for it to be seen in the physical. See, sometimes we're going through these these pains, these aches and pains, these, these wants, these financial needs, these financial gains that we may need. We may need a healing in our families. Or we may need a healing just in our own selves. We need relationship-type healings. See, those things do come about, but we just don't see them. They've already been done, but we just don't see them right there. Sometimes people say, well, how come I can't see it right now? Maybe it's not time for you to see it right now. Sometimes you have to go through some things in order to see the greatness of God. That's what this is about. When we say, I can't, when you're in that lonely place, that low place, you really can't. Understand, Scripture tells us that there's nowhere that we can be, no low that we can be. We can be in Hades itself. We can be in the depths right there. And yet God will be there with us. We can be high on a mountain, and God is there with us. God is with us. So there again, who's going to be against us? See, we get weary at times, and some, and some may believe that God just wants us in this low place. Get that out of your minds. Right there, you should just rebuke that right there and say, that's just a word of, of, of the enemy coming against you. God doesn't want you in a place. He wants you to come higher to him. See, God, it, maybe that God loves other folks more than he loves me. Well, that's not true believe that the, the, the disciples were asking Christ at one time, which one of us is the greatest? That's a nonsense question right there for Christ. He loves all of us. He loves all of us. God loves you all. So when you're thinking about, well, maybe he's looking out for someone else and not me, that's not the case. That's not the case. This is far, it's farther from the truth. See that, that no one other than Satan and his minions are speaking death into someone who has the promise of life. You have a promise of life. We've got to start realizing it and acting in such a way. See, it's the same reason as why we flow the colors of purple in here. We are from royal blood. We are royalty. So we've got to start thinking and adjusting your mind so that you can acknowledge that I am... I'm greater than what someone calls me. I'm greater than even what I call myself at times. So that's what the song was saying earlier that we were listening to. That's what it was saying. What do you call me, Lord? I want to hear just what you call me. How do you see me? See, a lowly place is not where you are to stay. It is not where you are to stay. As I skip through, and I'll give you just kind of a, a little piece of this we look at the prodigal son here in Luke 15 uh, 17 and then I'm going to jump to verse 20 you see in, in, in the prodigal son when he says he but when he came to himself this is Christ speaking here when he came to himself he said how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger so you understand that sometimes when you're in that low place, you've got to come into your own self. You've got to come back and snap back and say, wait a minute, where should I be? Verse 20 goes on and says, and he arose and came to his father. 
But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. It hurts sometimes. It hurts. It hurts a lot of times. But sometimes we have to hit rock bottom. That's the only way, the only way that we can come to our spiritual senses and turn the only one that's pulled it, turn to the only one that has pulled us out of the muck and mire. We have to hit rock bottom at times in order to come back and say, Lord, help me. Lord, I'm coming to you. You see, when that happens, that's what was going on with the prodigal son right then. The prodigal son was saying, wait a minute, I know who I am. See, I like to think that even when we go to the, when we go back and we think about what the prodigal son says, the prodigal son said that I'm not worthy. And I like to think that that's kind of a cop-out. That's kind of a cop-out when you say I'm not worthy. So the father knows that you're worthy. The father calls you that. But see, at that time, the prodigal son was not thinking of that. And you have to think about what a prodigal living is. It's, it's going out living foolishly, foolishnessly. It's going out just having a good time and not worrying about what else someone else may go through. You're just concerned about yourself and what a great time you're having out there. So that's what was going on. Prodigal son did many things. He even was uh, keeping up with the swine, cleaning up after swine, doing things that he would never have even thought of, never would have come into contact with, was not his custom. Was not his custom at the time. But see, he hit that rock bottom. See, our low place that only God can see and only God can move and everything else gets out of the way for his child. So you have to understand that the lowly place that you're in is a lot of times only God can get there to you and pull you out of it. And he's going to do whatever he can to do that. He's going to move anything out of the way to come for his child. So when we start thinking, I am a child of God, I am royalty, it changes your mindset. You start to walk differently. All of a sudden, you're no longer looking down as you walk. You're walking tall and proud. You're walking tall and proud because you now know who you are. You see, this, it, this only works, though. It only works when you humble yourselves and submit. You know, many of us, we have times, and I, I know, especially in our youth, let me tell you about mine. Well, I, I'm not going to tell you about mine, but it, it's a doozy at times. It's a doozy. But I'll tell you that sometimes we, we get so high and mighty that we forget <coughs> that we need to humble ourselves when we come before the Father. You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting whenever we go to the throne of grace, I pray that each and every one has humbled themselves when they go before. See, when we're praying, it's not just a physical thing here. This is a spiritual thing that's happening. It's a spiritual awakening that happens, especially when you know that someone is hearing our prayers and they're not even present. When someone comes back and says, I felt something. I felt something moved. I don't know how often you guys have heard that come back to you where you pray for someone in a time that may be in the darkest hour of your hour and definitely dark for the person that you're praying for and they say I felt something it's amazing, it's amazing so when we come we humble ourselves when we pray you see what does that really mean about humbling? well what it does is it requires you to admit to acknowledge that you do not have control over the situation and you need to stop trying to drive the bus or fly the plane at that time. You say, well, why, why do I choose to fly the plane or a bus? Because there's many people on there. We have to understand that you need to realize while there may be one person struggling, there's a larger body that's at play here. There's a larger body that's at play here. We don't do this by ourselves. All this, this move that we're about to have from this location to the next, it's not done by one person. This, these things that we do when we are uh, touching someone with a physical morsel of food, that's not done by one person. It's a larger and a greater body out there. So what someone is going through may be affecting someone else. The other thing is we have to learn that it, it's as painful for you, to, may, may be for you, it is for someone else that may need to learn from your experience. See, that's the other thing. Sometimes people need to learn from someone else's experience. You know, we always talk about, well, I, I kept my test into a testimony. Well, that test into a testimony is for someone else to learn and grow. Someone else to realize that, you know what, no longer will I say I can't. They start to say I can. 
it turns that I can't into I can. They start to see that, well, someone else went through this. I see where the Lord has brought them from. Now, all of a sudden, I can see the light. and I am now enlightened. I can do this. See, we're still learning from Paul right now. What he was going through, we're still learning from this day. Just spoke Paul's words right now. Prayerfully, everyone learned something from that. You see, we, we, we know that Paul went through it, but let's think about Job. Job lost everything, lost his family, lost his, his children, lost his wealth. Was he going through something at that time? Hmm. And that story, or fact, as I like to call it, everybody says there are little stories in the Bible, let's call them the fact stories. Hmm. You know, let's call them the fact stories. And so what he was going through at that time, we are still learning to this day. Learning how to submit, learning how to say, Lord, you are in control. I am not. When I am weak, you are at your strongest for me because you're fighting for me. Other people see it and they go, wait a minute. How did this, you know, you were, I, I had you down, especially some of your enemies. And we'll, we'll speak about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. Especially some, I had you down. I had my, my foot was on your neck and you weren't going anywhere. And then all of a sudden you bounce back. All of a sudden you bounce back. How did that happen? God happened. God showed up. That's how that happened. You see, we're, we're learning from Paul that he was truly under attack and afflicted. But see, I, I submit to you that joy truly does come in the morning, but just don't sleep past it. Just don't remain asleep past it. Joy does come, but don't sleep past it. You see, so sometimes we, we get so comfortable in our own distress that we can't see when someone is lending a hand. We can't see when someone else out there is saying, hey, I got this for you, I'll take care of it over here. We get so down on ourselves. See, joy does come in the morning. See, when you let that pass, you'll be left out and still feeling that God is forsaking you. How many times have many people thought they, 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 missed, they missed the mark and then they realize, God is still, they, they think to themselves, God is forsaking me. God is not, he's not with me. God is somewhere else. God is right there with you at all times, all times. So you want to make sure that you, you don't let, let that thought come in that God is forsaking you, and then you might have to change that wording around a little bit. Again, it's a mindset. It's, it's, it's how you think. It's not that God is forsaking you, but have you forsaken God? Have you forsaken God? See, sometimes we got to turn these words around, especially when they're words that don't, really the, the untruths out there, especially when there's untruths that are being spoken and spoken into your life, you've got to change that around and say, no, God hasn't forsaken me. Maybe it's me that has forsaken God. Maybe it's me that has stopped. And I say maybe, but nine times out of 10, it is you. It's us. We do that at times. It's when I preach that sermon about spiritually dry. At times we do, we get weary. See, God is there to give you that strength and pick you back up again. You know, that's such a, such a flesh move when you say God has forsaken me. It's easy to do. The flesh, the flesh will easily say that all the time. It's a flesh move always. Sometimes I like to tell people that don't think about it in the flesh sense. Think about it in the spiritual sense. Think about it as to what's really true. So again, I said about your enemies, and if you look in, the, in your um, program this morning, I've got it on the screen for folks online. Psalm 37, 1, 2 says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity or sin. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. You know, there is a lot of truth when the Lord says, Vengeance is mine. All you have to do is just sit back and watch. All you've got to do is sit back and watch. The Lord does not like sin. The Lord does not like sin. He can't even be a part of sin. So what happens when you start to say, oh, my enemies? Okay, yes, we do have some physical enemies out there. There are people that mean you no good. There are people that don't want you to succeed. There are people on your job that says, you know what, this promotion is coming up. I want it and you shouldn't get it. They're planting seeds in your boss's mind that this person, maybe they don't show up on, right on time. Maybe they're doing something, they're just lazy out there. They're not working hard enough. They're not working hard as me. Look, look at me. See, that's the problem. See, that's when those enemies like there that do that, they start saying, look at me. They cast that spotlight on them. And then when the boss really does look at them, 
<laughs> really does see how they're working. And then they wonder, well, how did I get passed over? That guy, I was telling them, they were doing all this, that, and the other, and they weren't doing a thing for the company. Yet the boss said, I'm going to take you at your word. I'm going to look at you. Started seeing that person's shortcomings. And then they don't make the cut. See, we can't worry about what your enemies are doing. All we do is pray for them, pray for ourselves, and keep on moving. Keep on moving. So that's why we handle those enemies. It's scriptures tell, says this. They're going to be cut down like the grass and wither away. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So I close here in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 8. It says, in this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. That's so beautiful right there. When Christ says, you will do greater things than I, this is not scripture that I believe, or that, that, this is not scripture that I am going to say here next. Christ says, you'll do greater things than I. What I truly believe that's telling us is that you are doing greater things because you have not seen him, yet your faith carries you through. That's not a biblical thing there. That's just me and my own thoughts, and I'm just sharing that with you. It's because of the fact that it's your faith that is carrying you and doing all of this uh, along with the Holy Spirit because you've not seen him. See, it always amazed me how the disciples showed, they, they saw many great works right there in front of them. And that, for me, would make it very easy. You know, that's a, that's a physical thing that we can see. It makes it very easy for us to say, oh, I believe that. Look at that. That's, that, that's great. You know, and there's other folks out there that will say, no, that's just a, a magic trick that he did. You know, but I, I, I submit to you that that is not that. That is not the magic trick. That is just God being God. That's what that is. And see, so when we come and doing greater things, when we have, even in this church, when we have healed people of sickness, it's not by us. It's by God and the Holy Spirit moving through us. But it's our faith that allows these things to continue to happen. We've seen it right here. We've seen just transformations happen. Again, it's nothing that we take credit for, and that's what... Uh, also, Paul was trying to say is that, you know, in, in, that, in that verse, it's not that he should be exalted. We should never exalt ourselves when we either come out of something or help someone else out of it. It's not about us. It's not about us. We're trying to show the power of God so that they will come to love God. See, no one likes to be grieved at any point. No one likes that. It doesn't matter how long the affliction is. It, it's just the heaviness is still going to be felt. No matter how long that affliction is, the heaviness is going to be felt. You know, we recently had a sister who cut her finger, and we know that usually it heals in time. And she was probably, she had to get some stitches. And so with those stitches, they're going to come out in time. We have a brother right now that just went through surgery on his hand. That will change. Prayerfully, that's going to be in the physical. He'll be able to see new movement without pain. See, these things are happening, but we have to understand that even as short as those afflictions may be, be it a couple of weeks, be it maybe two months, even as short as those may be, it's heavy. It's heavy at that time. There are people that have been battling illnesses for years. See, we have to understand God's time. He doesn't deal in our time as well. So even though that is heavy, he's still there with them. See, this is a test of faith at those times. It's a test of your faith. See, understand, when he speaks about gold more precious than gold, that it perishes and being tested by fire, you have to think about, well, how do you bend gold? Well, you've got to heat it up. You've got to heat it up, and then it starts to bend to your will. It starts to bend to your will. But prayerfully, your faith is much stronger than that, that it doesn't bend to the will of the world. It doesn't bend to the will of others. It only follows what Christ says. It only follows God. You see, that's the, that, that's the beauty of when, you, when God says, you know, we're going to put that to the test it by fire. Test it by fire. See, gold is so precious. It's, it's, 
You know, I think it's still one of the most precious metals out there. I don't know if it's above or, or below, but I can tell you each and every one of these metals that we decide that we want to put on our necks or on our wrists or on our fingers or what have you, each and every one of them will bend when tested by fire. If you don't believe me, go test it out for yourself. Heat something up and see what happens with it. It starts to change its form. See, the thing about us is we should not change our form when we are being tested, when our faith is being tested. So I ask yourself at this, how strong is your faith? So I'm going to close. How strong is your faith? Are you those one and done type of prayer warriors out there? Well, I prayed one time and that should be enough. Or do you get back and go back to the well? Get back in line. Get back in line. See, when you get back in line, don't you, you go back and you say, Lord, I know you're hearing me, but Lord, I'm still with you on this. We're still walking together on this affliction. You see, Paul right there, he says, he didn't say once, he didn't say twice, but three times. Three times before he got that. Sometimes it may go on further, but we just have to just keep asking. You see, in that midst of when you keep asking, when you come out of that fire, prayerfully you'll be able to say, I asked the Lord 52 times, and I finally saw it. It's not that it wasn't done, it's that I finally saw it. And then someone else can come back to you and say, you know what? It took you 52 times? Well, I was only at 51. I'm going to go 52, 53, and I'm going to keep going because I know, I believe that the Lord heard your prayers and heard your cries, that he's going to hear mine. My time is coming. My time is coming. This, my faith is being tested. I'm in that lowly place. I say I can't, but I now I know I can because I've seen it, because I've seen it. Don't be so short-sighted that you miss the very most excellent and mo of our most high God's brilliant work. Don't be so, so short-sighted to that. When you get so short-sighted to that, you just miss out on so much, so much. Again, it's not always necessarily about you. You're not the only one on this plane. You're not the only one on this bus. There may be others out there that you will be able to inspire. I was speaking yesterday and I, I was telling a group of pastors, I said, you know, John, we plant the seed, we plant the seed, and then we just let the Holy Spirit just fertilize and water and just watch it sprout. But we gotta do our part. So you're precious, and he wants you to know that you're precious and to solely trust in you. You are so precious to our Father. Just take a moment and think about that. You are so precious to him. He loves you. There is no harm that he would want to see come to you. So whatever it is that people are going through, myself included, I don't, I don't fall on any, I'm no higher than anybody else. I don't have, I got the same line to Christ, same line to God that y'all have. We all go through things. Just know that you are precious and loved. And oftentimes you got to stop looking to your, from your left and your right and start looking up. Stop being blinded. See, when you're going through things, you're just blinded by everything else around you. And you're blinded due to the circumstance or the condition that you are in at that moment. But you are so, you're so blinded that you can't see the condition that God has for you over here. You can't see that. I'm going to leave you with this definition of lowly because it's, it's very interesting to me. Lowly, when we think about it, it's, uh, the dictionary says it's a low in growth or position. See, here's the other thing, as I mentioned, is we've got to humble ourselves. See, lowly also means humble in station, condition, nature. It also means meek and humble in our attitude. See, so you can be lowly, but which one do you choose? I like to think that we'll all start to choose the humbleness, the meekness. When we go to our Father, we want to say, Lord, heal me of this. Lord, Keep these, these folks away from me. Bind them away. Bind them. Whatever is already there, loosen it from me. Loosen it from me. We go there humbly, humbly, and get out of the low place that's of death and just be lowly in humbleness. And you can begin to say, I can. Father, thank you right now, Lord. Thank you for just who you are, Lord. Your very nature, your very caring ways, you're just... You're just such an awesome father to us, Lord. Thank you for just sharing and showing us that we can get back in line whenever we need to 
hear when we need you to hear from us, Lord. Our prayers will not go unanswered. Nothing comes to that point. And I thank you for that. I thank you for just the ones that are here that are hearing it now, the ones that will hear this later, Lord. I pray that in some way that it touches their lives, allows them to just move forward, Lord, and not look backwards. Move forward in you and remain in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.